Wavetable synthesis has caused an absolute explosion of new sonic possibilities. The leap from synthesizers sounding like this to like this is conceptually actually pretty simple. But this new type of synth could never have come into existence without the accumulated hard work of a bunch of very smart people over a very long period of time. This is the story of everything that needed to go right for this wonderful new type of synthesizer to come into existence. And at the end, we'll learn how to put all that knowledge to work to create our very own wavetable sounds. In the early 19th century, people started to notice that the electric arcs used in vacuum tubes and light bulbs would spontaneously start to make humming noises. And it was suspected that these arcs could be harnessed to make consistent oscillations. But it took almost a hundred more years for people to actually be able to build functional electric oscillators. And if you didn't already know, the oscillator is the sound source of a synthesizer. Shortly after, people started inventing electronic instruments left and right. Notice that these instruments have a very particular timbre, and that's because the early oscillators were only able to make a couple of very basic waveforms. A waveform is a graphical representation of how an audio signal changes over time. Different waveforms have different spectra, which for our purposes mean they sound different from one another. For a deep dive into the complexities of timbre, check the video linked somewhere around here. As technology advanced, so did the synthesis possibilities. Hugh Lacan's electronic sack butt was the first instrument that allowed the player to change the timbre of the sound in real time using a control on the instrument. Also kind of cool, Hugh Lacane was the mentor of my mentor, Kevin Austin. And Hugh Lacane and my very own Zadie worked together at the National Research Council in Ottawa for like 35 years. <laughs> In the late 1950s, we start to see a transition from synthesizers being invented by individual people to synthesizers being designed and manufactured by companies. It's also the time where the format of these synthesizers coalesces into a common style called subtractive synthesis. Subtractive synthesis involves two key components, the oscillator and the filter. The oscillator creates a full spectrum signal and the filter subtracts from it in order to shape the sound. For a complete explanation of subtractive synthesis, check the video linked above. There's a theme developing here. I make videos about the synthesizer things. <laughs> In the 60s and 70s, synthesizers reached the public consciousness and became more of a consumer item. This move was switched on by Wendy Carlos's switched on Bach. And oh my God, yes, I have a video about that too. But in terms of the technology, most of the work went into refining the design rather than coming up with new types of synthesis. But quietly, in the background, someone was working, lurking in the shadows and did a thing that would change synthesizers forever. I am looking for people. Maybe it's you. The people that I'm looking for make music on the computer and they want to develop their skills so they can do it better. Maybe you want to get really good at programming wavetable synths or any type of synth. Maybe you want to consistently and easily turn your musical ideas into finished songs. Maybe you want to have really amazing mixes or really exciting production. Whatever it is, if you want to take your music to the next level, I think you should check out Sarah School. At Sarah School, I teach weekly one-on-one -on -one sliding scale music production and composition lessons. Basically, the way a session looks is we meet up every week on Zoom, you show me what you've been working on, and we use that as a jumping off point to work on whatever skill it is that you want to develop. I've been doing it for about four years now, and if you wanna hear from a bunch of my happy customers, you can do so at sarah-feldman.com slash School. And while you're there, you can sign up for a lesson, and you probably should, because it's really fun. Okay, back to the video. In the late 50s and early 60s, Max Matthews developed a computer program called Music that could sequence and synthesize digital music. <laughs> It was 
actually not the first computer to make sounds, but it was the first that uses the same digital audio technology that we use today called pulse code modulation or PCM. So let's take a second to understand PCM and how it works. Now we know that an analog signal comes from changing voltages, but how do we make a signal using digital technology? We make a representation of that analog signal using samples. Let's imagine representing one cycle of a saw wave using digital audio. We're gonna break up that signal into a bunch of tiny slices. Each of those slices is going to represent how intense the signal was at the time of the slice. So we have a slice here that says the signal is this strong at this moment. And then we have the next slice that says the signal is this strong at this moment. And we have another slice after that saying in the following moment, the signal was this strong, etc., etc. If we make a ton of slices and play them back very fast, we can represent our signal accurately enough that our brains can't tell the difference between it and an analog signal. It's sort of the equivalent of a sonic flipbook. If we flip the pages back fast enough, it looks like the dot is moving. Okay, ah! now it is time to meet the most important character of our story, Wolfgang Pomp. As a child, he was already showing some extremely nerdy tendencies. His dad gifted him a Farfisa organ, but it didn't really sound like the Hammonds he was used to hearing in his favorite music. It was clear to me that the basis of the Hammond sound was sine waves. My Farfisa had some sawtooth waveforms, so I designed a low-pass filter circuit, which made the sound more sine-like. I had to attach a filter to each of the oscillators, which was about 70 times. Anyway, I managed to do that, and the organ sounded much better. Then, Palm became aware of Moog instruments through Emerson, Lake, and Palmer recordings. This time, he was inspired to build his very own oscillator, so he could get that swagged out portamento that he was hearing in the ELP records. As a young adult, Palm developed a great talent for synthesizer design. He was already constructing and selling fully functional standalone synthesizers. But as often as the case in these stories, it was a personal connection that made it possible for him to truly innovate. In the mid-1970s, Palm became friends with members of the band Tangerine Dream, and they were, uh, obviously really into synthesizers. So they were stoked to become friends with a guy like Wolfgang. One of the members, Christoph Franke, had a connection with a local university that was developing the tiny little chips that make personal computing possible called microprocessors. And Franke could not have known what he was setting into motion by introducing this little piece of hardware to Palm. <laughs> Editor Sarah here. Uh, things got a little convoluted in the scripted version, so I'm gonna take a second shot at this part. Wolfgang Palm was inspired to try out using microprocessors in his synthesizer design. Microprocessors use the PCM digital audio technology that we learned about a few minutes ago with the samples, the audio flipbook, all that stuff. And when using PCM technology, the conceptual leap from subtractive synthesis to wavetable synthesis is remarkably straightforward. PCM uses samples to represent a waveform. So if you use PCM to make a digital oscillator, you basically draw the waveform you want into a little audio file by moving the sample values around. Then you play that file back and the speed you play it back corresponds to the pitch you hear. If you're gonna draw in your own waveform, Obviously, you could draw in something basic, like a saw wave or a square wave, but at this point, it is spectacularly clear that you could just as easily draw in any wave shape that you can imagine. And that is so sick, right? We just went from four or five possible waveforms to infinite possible waveforms. And now we are so close to inventing wavetable synthesis. But listen to these examples and see if you can tell what's missing from them. What's missing is that they don't change. Most interesting, compelling, emotional sounds evolve in some kind of way over time. Now, there's nothing stopping us from making that audio file longer, drawing in some kind of very fun, exciting, changing waveform, and then playing back only a portion of the audio file at a time. And from there, 
changing the position of the portion of the audio file that's being read back so that we can have the spectrum of our sound evolve over time. And voila, we have invented wavetable synthesis. Let's go. After making this incredible discovery, Palm created his own company called PPG so he could manufacture and sell wavetable synths. Oh no! Apparently the first couple attempts didn't sound very good and the digital filters were kind of harsh. But in 1981, PPG released the Wave 2 and Wavetable made it into the world stage. Kind of. In the 80s, digital music technology absolutely took off, but in the world of synthesis, it was really more FM synthesis that got everyone's attention. In 1987, PPG closed, but many of its employees, including Palm himself, went over to a new company called Waldorf, and they made a bunch of amazing synths, including the 2007 Waldorf Blofeld. <laughs> Nowadays, of course, the most powerful and popular synthesizers all use wavetable technology. The wavetable technology itself hasn't changed much since the 80s, but I do think the key advancement has been using wavetable oscillators and integrating them with powerful subtractive and FM capabilities, really amazing modulations, unison, and built-in audio effects. It's kind of like wavetable on steroids. This synth is called Vital. It combines wavetable oscillators with a bunch of modern advanced synthesis capabilities, some of which I will show to you now. I'm going to start off with this wavetable called Angry Electric Dog. Ooh, okay. Let's try one of these wavetable transformations. Okay, that sounds kind of interesting. I could see that working as like a top layer to my sound. So I'll move that sound to the second filter and make it a high pass. See what happens if we add some unison to this. Sounds cool, but it is very bright and there's some stuff up there that definitely hurts. So I'm gonna try changing my high pass to a band pass to control the very, very high frequencies. Okay, nice. That's shelved out and it's not gonna fight with my lower layer now. It doesn't hurt to listen to, which is good. Let's bring some digestive trauma into the mix and route it into the first filter. I'm gonna add some unison to that too because I have no self-control or self-respect. I'm gonna try dropping this an octave and maybe using a different wavetable. I'm gonna modulate the filter cutoff with an envelope generator. Okay, whoa, that sounds crazy. Maybe I'll just turn this whole sound into a pluck. Sick, I kind of love it. It'd be fun to add like a poquito of noise to this. Just double down on the cheese. Sounds wrong, but maybe that's good. Okay, I feel like I already have a sick sound. Let's get into some effects. Hard to say no to squashing the hell out of it. Okay, and maybe a bit of verb. Sick. <laughs> 